All right, welcome everybody to this second, uh, actually third session of Open Access Australasia's OA Week programme. Um, uh, it's great to see so many people joining. Uh, my name is Ginny Barber, I'm the Director of Open Access Australasia um, and I am just going to quickly do some housekeeping. Uh, so just to note the usual, this session is being recorded and will be shared under a CC BY licence on our, on our website afterwards. Um, please keep your microphone muted and your camera turned off throughout the, um, throughout the session. Uh, please do type your questions into the chat and any links you'd like us to see and we will aim to finish on time but note, note this session is 90 minutes so um, so it's longer than the other sessions in the uh, in the program. Um, so I am delighted to hand over to Claire Thorpe who will be chairing this session. Uh, Claire is the Director of Library Services at Southern Cross University and she is on the um, Executive Committee of Open Access Australasia. Thank you very much Claire. Thank you, Ginny, and I'd like to extend my welcome to everyone joining us today. And we will begin with the acknowledgement of country. Open Access Australasia acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and New Zealand and across our region, and particularly acknowledge their connections to land, sea and community. And we uh, pay our respects to elders past, present, and any Aboriginal, Torres Strait Islander, Maori or Pacifica people who are joining us here today. I'm joining you today from Young and Bear Country at the southern tip of the Gold Coast. So as Jean mentioned, today we have a series of lightning talks from a number of leaders around our region. And as she mentioned, it is a 90 minute session. So each speaker will have approximately six to seven minutes to give us an update of what's happening in their area. And we are in meeting mode today. So the chat facility is open and I encourage you to put your questions into the chat and we will have time to answer those, I hope, with our speakers towards the end. So without further ado, we'll get straight into it. Our first speaker this morning is Dr. Kath. This morning, this afternoon, or this evening, depending on where you're joining us from, our first speaker, Dr. Kathy Foley, is Australia's Chief Scientist. Thank you, Dr. Foley. Thanks very much, Claire, and thanks everyone for the kind introduction to be here today, because open access, I think, is incredibly important, not just for us as researchers, but for humanity. Now, I'm actually joining you today from Hawaii, where I'm attending an applied superconductivity conference, and I'm on the lands of the first Hawaiians whose Polynesian ancestors settled on these islands 800 years ago. I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land that we're all joining on for today as well, and acknowledge the elders caring for those lands, pay my respects to the old ones who've come before and the young ones who'll follow. Australia's First Nations culture is the oldest continuous culture in the world, with the first scientists passing on lessons of the land, the sea and the sky to today's scientists through stories, song and dance. And this is really showing the extraordinary sustainability of Indigenous publishing, passing on their knowledge for millennia, and we have much to learn from them. I also extend my respect to all Indigenous people joining us today. The international momentum towards making research literature much more accessible to a wider audience is great to see. We are operating in an incredibly knowledge-based economy and bringing research literature out from behind paywalls, opening it up to industry, government, professionals, citizen scientists and the general public will contribute to social cohesion, a culture of collaboration. It will um, drive discovery, innovation and prosperity and as many of you know, as Australia's Chief Scientist, I've been championing the development of an Australian national strategy for open access to research literature. And I've discussed open access with many people, many of you probably on the call today, and organisations across Australia, as well as internationally. Whether it's publishing industry, the research community, broader industries and government, and I've talked to about 70 stakeholders so far. So thank you for those here today that have been involved and receptive, helpful, offering insights and feedback. And I do really appreciate robust discussion and I hope this continues. I don't need to introduce this audience to the concept of open access or why it's important, but I'd like to stress that it is important that the open access approach is designed to reach the broad social and economic benefits. Research literature is not just for res the research community, that has an enormous potential to assist in driving the innovation needed to address social and environmental challenges and to drive productivity and economic wealth uh, growth, as well as importantly, the cultural development of, the, of, any, of our nation. 
You may have seen the Productivity Commission report a few weeks ago, which reported that while larger firms are more likely to outsource innovation, most small SMEs, small to medium enterprises, source their innovation from external open sources. Therefore, if we improve their access, we increase their innovation. And I was keen to learn from a recent IP Australia report about how trademarks and IP also often are early indicators of success, again, reinforcing the importance of facilitating open access. Open access and open science more broadly are complex reforms that require close consideration of all stakeholders in the research ecosystem. And that's including funding bodies, researchers, reviewers, publishers, government and industry. And I know my ambitions are, are, my aims are ambitious, but one of the options I am considering is a model that not only makes Australian-led research literature available to the international audience without paywalls, but also unlocks the research literature, including international and back catalog papers for all Australians to read. However, there is no need to start from scratch. The current system has value. And the aim is to preserve what is valuable as we shift towards a new model. One of the models I'm considering would involve negotiating a single open access agreement with each publisher to ensure all um, Australian-led research is published open access and that all Australia, not just researchers, can access the world's research literature, including back catalogues. We're also in the process of considering other models to assess this as a whole of system approach, as the different models are not necessarily mutually exclusive. Open access is often approached from the angle of new research, but most of the back catalog remains behind paywalls. The reality of science advancement is that discovery is an iterative process that builds on what has gone before. You've probably seen in Google Scholar talking about the standing on the shoulders of giants, which means facilitating access to be previously to previously published work. Whatever model we end up with, it is important to preserve the critical role of peer review. This is the foundation of trust in science and research, which is a task usually done for no payment and it is increasingly difficult to find peer reviewers in a world of increasing research output. Reviewers are usually blind to the authors and any new models such as open peer review will need to take into account fairness, safety in terms of bullying and harassment and trolling and that sort of thing, and efforts to build diversity and inclusion. And publishers have an important role to play. They are currently the custodians of much research knowledge and they organize workflows, the catalog content and ensure research accessibility. Sustainable funding is also a challenge. As we all know, publishing and the required infrastructure costs money. And it's not a magic process done by an invisible hand. Pricing is complex and the preservation of niche and small publishers is absolutely essential for the preservation of bibliodiversity. We did an initial analysis conducted by my office last year, and it confirmed stakeholder support for the development of a national open access strategy. And my office then engaged Ernest and Young to delve further into these issues. And Ernest and Young's analysis has confirmed the potential social and economic benefits of a centralized model. And they found the proposed model over the next three decades will increase business investment by $4.6 billion, GDP by about $3.3 um, 3, 3 billion per annum by 2050, and trade output by $6.7 uh, billion. Their analysis has also confirmed that this model could be delivered through existing IT infrastructure. So my role is to provide advice to government on open access strategies for Australia. I'm currently working to finalize and submit my advice to government by the end of this year. My advice will detail a range of models, including a centralized model, which I just described, a funder mandate model, a repository based model, and a do nothing model. Assuming the government agrees to proceed on one of these options, and I guess the do nothing mo model is proceeding with doing nothing, there will no doubt be opportunities for further engagement to refine the model and its implementation. So thanks for the opportunity to provide this brief update and uh, back to you, Claire. Thank you, Dr. Foley, and thank you especially for joining us from your travels. Our next speaker is Dr. George Slim from the New Zealand Office of Prime Minister's 
uh, where he is the chief science advisor. Thank you. Uh, sorry. Um, uh, kia ora, uh, George Slim. I am senior advisor in um, in Juliet Gerard's Dame Professor Dame Juliet Gerard's office. She is um, the Prime Minister's chief science advisor. Um, I guess to explain our role in getting involved in open access, uh, the job of the New Zealand Prime Minister's chief science advisor is pretty much exactly what it says on the box. Um, Prime Minister wants science advice. The Prime Minister gets science advice. And we try and avoid getting too involved in um, science policy. We're much more interested in getting science into into other policy rather than the policy around science funding. So this is a slightly unusual unusual project for us. Um, we were approached by a very passionate intern. Um, we we run an internship program. I think we've had up to in the last five six years we've had close to thirty interns. Now we were approached by um, a very passionate intern, Tom Saunders, who said he wanted to have a look at this area and um, previously in a role in the New Zealand Science, Science Ministry, I had looked some 10 years ago at, at open access and um, spent quite a bit of time and a reasonable amount of the New Zealand taxpayers' money and really not got anywhere at all. So I was very keen to um, to help him and, and see how it went. So, so in the end, he he put forward a fantastic, uh, you know, the future is open, the report is on our website, and I, we can circulate a link um, in the chat. And it, essentially, it came down to, to six recommendations after a lot of talk with a huge range of people circulating graphs all around around New Zealand. He, he developed a report which, which had six recommendations, which are assemble a steering group to have a look at future work consult widely and particularly in partnership with Māori and the research sector, undertake a review of academic publishing in New Zealand, set out a roadmap, endorse the principles of OA, which I guess goes without saying, and consider options for an OA mandate, which is, I think, where the rubber hits the road in, as far as New Zealand. So we're a lot less far down the track than, than, than clearly is, is, is happening in Australia. Um, but Juliet doesn't normally um, uh, commend the recommendations from an intern's report for us. So um, she's chosen to this time, which shows her, her interest in the area. Our, our overall approach is, is predicated on that this is a, a, a smallish piece in the much wider puzzle around open science, around how science is valued, accessed and used. and, and However, having said that, this is probably um, one of the more important and more visible pieces because a lot of the opening data up for scrutiny and so on, that involves a lot of technical work, whereas getting, getting what the taxpayer um, funds in front of them uh, as open access is, is probably one of the, the headline actions. So we were keen to, we were keen to, keen to get, get this started. It's, it's often said that if a government funds the research and the taxpayers have a right to access the research, I would have said um, more generally, if the taxpayers are funding the research, they have the right to benefit that research. And if, 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 if too much access, if we lose the, the, the ability to commercialize research, if, if we, we damage the ability to benefit from the research by, by getting it's too open access, um, then we we are, it's counterproductive. However, the IP issues around around getting um, getting the research which has already been published open access I think are a lot a lot simpler because the stuff is designed to be out there in the public domain. You're not you're not breaking any form of confidentiality. You're, you, it's, it's reasonably clear who's the, who has the rights to the underpinning research, and so this seems like a a, a good way. A good way to 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 get involved in the, in the open science open science business. New Zealand and Australia and, and a number of the other companies countries around the Pacific have some specific issues. Um, principally, the the need to to make available indigenous research, which doesn't necessarily fit the international paradigm. So a lot of the structures, uh, particularly around publishing and and the, the way research is assessed really don't fit the indigenous model and New Zealand has been putting a lot of time and effort into working through this and there are some significant reforms underway uh, 
around how the New Zealand system will work, which hopefully will will, will make that we make that better. We we also face the, the general issue that the, the research system is very short on resource. So essentially we need to we need to do approach open access in a way which which doesn't um, doesn't cost too much for a start and doesn't reinforce the the inequities of, of access reinforce current inequities across the across the system as well as as the the, the issues that Kathy was talking around in terms of um, preservation and um, maintaining the structures that that kind of underpin in research so um, with uh, Tom's report in our hand and and from a position of of no great power we've been trying to push things we push things along and, and the first thing we found is that everybody agrees essentially across the system the institutions uh, the vast majority of researchers um, the science funders everybody agrees that we need to do this we need to make the research suit open open access the second point again as as kathy said is that the the it infrastructure and the rest of the infrastructure is largely in place as i understand it and kim might uh, correct me on this point all our universities encourage placing the final accepted version of manuscripts and open access repositories i think two of them now mandate it our Korean Research Institutes, which is the equivalent of the, of the CSIRO, operate slightly differently, but but it shouldn't be difficult for them to get the infrastructure in place. So, so we we have a huge amount of goodwill to do it. We have the infrastructure to do it, <laughs> and yet uh, we still are not doing it. And that is the is the, is the issue that we are we are working on. <clears throat> the, the real action lies in 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 mandates. I think. You often hear the fact that uh, you know organizing scientists is like herding cats, and and that is very very true indeed. You you put down a saucer of milk and you are uh, covered in cats. And so if we can put, I think, incentives um, to ensure that the research is is made open access, that that will that will get things moving. And so the major funder in research uh, in New Zealand, the Ministry of Business, Innovation and Employment, has been working on this area for a while. We have chatted to them about, about our report and, and put our weight behind what they are doing. My understanding is that the advice is going to the minister soon around, around putting in, in, in place some sort of action on the behalf of the, the funders to um, to make changes and, and ensure that the, the work that they fund is published uh, open access. And we are hoping that that will result in, in direct action reasonably soon. In the meantime, as I said, there's considerable reform going through the system. And one of the things we're introducing are, are narrative CVs to try and move away from straight, straight publication metrics uh, in terms of the assessment research of research and a number of different ways of, of judging the, the excellence and the impact of research that the New Zealand government funds. So, so thank you. I will, I will hand you back. Thank you very much. I have been remiss to mention that if you are um, tweeting or posting about today's session, please use the hashtags OA Week and open for climate justice, which are the two hashtags that we're using right across International Open Access Week. As George has mentioned funders, it's very timely that our next presenter is Prue Torrance from the National Health and Medical Research Council. Thank you, Prue. Thank you. I might just um, put up a couple of slides. Um, so I have lots I could say about open access and why it's important, um, but we have just introduced a new policy, so I think perhaps I should just focus on what's new and what's changed um, to bring everyone up to speed. Um, so I'll just double check, can people hear me? Yes, good. Um, so our new policy. Um, see if I can get the slides to move along. They're not moving, sorry. It's only a couple here. So NHMRC released our revised policy on the 22nd of September, and that includes 
um, an open access policy document and a supporting document around open access and retention of ownership rights. Um, the key changes in our policy is it does require that where NHMRC funded research has resulted in peer reviewed scholarly publications, then it must be made available openly immediately upon publication, which removes the previous 12 month embargo that was allowed under our old policy. Um, and using an open license, which means publications can be used and shared widely. The implementation of the new requirements commenced immediately, meaning that for all new grants awarded under NHMRC grant opportunity guidelines issued from the date of the new policy, 20th of September, um, will be required to follow this policy. Um, but for all other NHMRC grants, it's being phased in for full implementation by the 1st of January, 2024. Uh, this actually does allow for a period of transition where I said um, it applies immediately to new grants. What we're talking about is grants that are open now um, for calls for applications. So applications have to be submitted, received, uh, assessed and go through peer review and outcomes announced. So we are looking at grants commencing in say six to 12 months time that may not result in publications immediately. So really all of it is, is heading towards a full implementation and full transition by 1st of January, 2024 as the real critical date for all NHMRC funded research. Um, why do we support open access? I probably don't need to go into much detail there for this audience, but it is about ensuring the greatest impact from NHMRC funded research, um, making research outcomes available openly, supports knowledge sharing and rapid innovation as Dr. Foley has elaborated already. Um, and in the space of health and medical research, of course, it's also important for just advancing human health and improving human health outcomes. And this was demonstrated very well through the sharing of research findings very rapidly during the COVID-19 pandemic. The revision of NHMRC's open access policy is based on extensive consultation with the Australian research sector. Uh, we started this conversation a couple of years ago. Um, and advice from our expert committees. Importantly, it's in line with the growing international shift towards immediate open access publishing. It is aligned with Plan S and NHMRC is now a member of Coalition S. And the little icon on the slide there is actually Coalition S's um, icon. Uh, we do recognize though that we are the first public funding agency in Australia to require immediate open access for publications arising from publicly funded research. Um, and that there will be lessons learned um, and sharing needed about our implementation with, with other funding agencies um, that may be looking at this as well. The other few things I just wanted to take you through is um, some other key points around our new open access policy. Uh, clear communication is a key driver in the new policy. Um, we've combined all of our previous policy and guidance and FAQs into a single document and tried to lay it out as clearly as possible, addressing many of the frequently asked questions we had with our previous policy and also during the consultation. And there were really clear distinction between the sections that outlined the core policy and the sections that outlined guidance um, to help people implement and navigate through the requirements. Uh, the second key thing is around routes to open access. NHMRC has no preferred route for open access and does respect the diversity of approaches. And we've tried to give really clear guidance about the acceptable routes and locations for making publications openly accessible, which does include both journal-based and repository-based options. Author choice is also a very key principle. Uh, we want to make it clear that authors have the freedom to submit manuscripts to their journal of choice, and we are not restricting any options. And that does include still publishing in subscription-based journals if that is the preferred publication location for the researcher. Um, and we do include links to resources to assist research, research, researchers when choosing a journal to try and meet those kind of compliance requirements. Um, so importantly, those multiple routes to open access means that there are still many choices available to researchers. Um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander rights is another key feature of our policy and perhaps what makes it uh, a bit different and new to um, other funders internationally, although we did learn from some conversations and experience going on in New Zealand and in um, Canada around these issues. So what our policy does is require consideration of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander intellectual and cultural rights. And that includes considering who owns and has the right to use and distribute research results and how to acknowledge the involvement of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander individuals and communities involved in the research. So this could be through co-authorship or traditional knowledge notices or labels in publication and metadata or through other forms of acknowledgement. 
and there's considerable um, guidance and resources, uh, links to existing resources to assist researchers um, here. But the important thing for our policy really is we've made it clear that a more restrictive um, license or a copyright license is allowed as appropriate for publications about research involving Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander people and communities. We've given that kind of freedom to choose what's most appropriate back to the people who own the resources. NHMRC funding, um, we have not made any changes to the allowable use for NHMRC funding, which does include paying for publication costs, but we have made it clearer that it is an allowable use um, because we did find through our consultation that there was a lot of confusion around that. Um, and importantly, also our policy clarifies that not all routes to open access or compliance with our policy requires payment of a fee. There are routes where, um, such as repository-based open access, that authors can comply um, but not incur a fee. And that, you know, obviously cost is a factor that um, researchers need to consider when they're deciding to publish their work. Monitoring and compliance is the last thing I'll mention, and it's obviously something people are interested in. Um, as a funder, obviously we use our policy to try and drive um, system change, and that affects um, behaviour of people right across the research system. Um, but when it comes to compliance, our funding agreement is actually with research institutions. But I might say something firstly about researchers. An HMRC funded researchers can comply with the open access policy through two main routes, back to that routes issue. They can make the version of record freely available immediately upon publication. This route may be associated with a payment of a fee, apart from like an article processing fee, which may be paid directly by the author or it could be paid by the institution covered by an agreement between the institution and publisher. The other main route is to make the author accepted manuscript immediately open access in an online repository, such as an institutional or other subject-based repository, and there is no fee associated with this route. So there are the two main ways in which researchers can comply with our policy. We have been asked, by some journals, what do we need to do to help comply? And obviously we don't, we don't directly fund journals or have any direct relationship with, with journals or publishers. Um, so we can't comply any type of um, action by them. But I am pleased to see that major journals already provide choices for researchers to enable compliance with open access policies in general. So generally when you're submitting something to a journal, you'll be are given the options of making it immediate open access enabled by an article processing charge or immediate open access enabled by an institutional level agreement, um, the um, so-called read and publish agreements that might be in place, um, or by depositing a copy of the author accepted manuscript in a repository concurrently with the publication. Now, most major journals at the moment um, would say that it is restricted to 12 months, like a 12 month embargo, but we would hope to see um, that our policy might change behaviour in journals over the next, say, 12 months before that critical date of 2024 um, to start allowing that um, concurrent publishing and the rights retention strategy that we have in place in our policy. We encourage researchers and institutions to get across but it is one way of ensuring that ability to deposit in a repository immediately um, is enabled. But to go back to what we will do in terms of monitoring, monitoring implementation and compliance, um, NHMRC's focus is on the big picture. We will be asking research institutions that we fund um, what they have done to align their policies and support for researchers to uh, support the implementation of the new policy. We'll be asking that in, over the next 12 months or so. And we will be looking at movements in key indicators, such as the overall proportion of NHMRC research that's published open access over time and how that moves over time, as well as various other sub indicators we might look at. We're still working on developing an overarching framework for monitoring um, the implementation of the policy and, and being able to evaluate its efficiency and effectiveness going forward. Um, and we'll be um, seeking some advice from some of our advisory committees on the things we need to do. But the important point I wanted to make is that our initial monitoring compliance is very much focused on the big picture we appreciate that there is a transition period um, for all the players in the systems to start complying with a major change in policy. Um, so we won't be looking at compliance at a grant by grant level um, immediately, that's for sure. They're the key aspects of our policy, which I think is probably enough of an introduction for me. Thank you. Thank you, Prue, for that um, really comprehensive overview of the recent policy change. 
We're going to bounce back across the Tasman and I'd like to invite on screen Kim Tyree, who will be speaking to us from CONSUL, the Council of New Zealand University Librarians. Claire, just chiming in to let you know that we've had a couple of Zoom issues behind the scenes. So I just want to uh, make sure that uh, Kim is still with us. And Kim, if you could just check your microphone and camera. Kia ora everybody, sorry about that. Let me just uh, get on track again. So as George said, there's uh, quite a lot happening in open access in Aotearoa. It seems like there's a synergy or an alignment of a lot of different things and it's all around uh, partnerships uh, with key players across the research system. Uh, we're up to the fifth year of our open access uh, report in Aotearoa and a big namahi nui thank you to all the people that have been working on the CONSOL open uh, access report. There is five years worth of really rich data on the state of open access in Aotearoa and all those reports are uh, available on uh, the University's New Zealand website. And uh, what the latest report shows us is that 42% of the publicly funded research in our universities is still behind paywalls, which means that only those who are privileged enough to have access. So we still have a long way to go. Academic libraries on their own are not making enough of a difference. And you can see that Aotearoa New Zealand is lagging quite uh, far behind uh, when it comes to open access. And as George said that we have, uh, all our universities have open repositories and so the infrastructure is there. It's more about that commitment. And George also did speak about mandates and funders. As yet, we don't actually have any mandates. And so that puts us a little bit behind the eight ball in terms of getting our open access up. The other thing to note is that the hybrid models that currently exist are costing Aotearoa quite a lot of money and some would say too much money. If we look at the infographic there, uh, we've paid 14.6 million in the last five years in article processing charges. And the team would probably say that that would be underreported because as you know, these things are really tricky to get the data about how much uh, is being spent across our universities on uh, article processing charges, uh, both here and in Australia. So what is really important for us is uh, kotahitanga and whakawhanaungatanga. So kotahitanga is about unity and collaboration and uh, whakawhanaungatanga is about shared relationships and bonding. It's that coming together to uh, work towards a national uh, approach when it comes to open access. Uh, I just wanted to acknowledge uh, Tom uh, Saunders and his report 
uh, the future to open. Um, Tom's been doing amazing work in this space and uh, it his report will actually help to shape some of the direction uh, of a, a national approach to uh, research, open research in Aotearoa. So as I mentioned, Consul is partnering with others to future the research agenda. And this is just some of the work that's gone on in the last uh, few years. Uh, the other thing that's happening is Universities New Zealand, which is the uh, peak body of vice chancellors in uh, Aotearoa New Zealand, uh, are very close to signing off on a pan-university uh, open access statement, which will be a more unified approach and a commitment to open access uh, across the university sector, which is really exciting. Uh, also part of the work that Universities New Zealand uh, committees, uh, which includes Consul are doing, is uh, some training uh, and building capacity, which, is, uh, which will be needed uh, in the coming years as uh, opened, as we become more open. So as well as that strategic partnering, it's about making sure that when mandates do come, we are ready and we can support our institutions to uh, meet the requirements. So like a feki, or uh, that's the Māori word for octopus, we have uh, tentacles in many places as consul. Uh, and we're working with great people like Tom and George. Um, Aotearoa is quite a small country, so uh, it's great to be here because there are lots of familiar faces uh, of OA practitioners and advocates and people doing great work in this space. We're getting to work more closely with uh, Open Access Australasia, our colleagues in University of New Zealand, and indeed funders to come uh, closer to a more national approach. In our, our strategic kitty, um, our strategic priorities for Consul, uh, open scholarship is one of the main pillars or PO. And PO are the carved posts that you'll see around Aotearoa New Zealand um, and uh, on Marae in Aotearoa New Zealand. Uh, so it's, it's a really important part of the work that we're doing together as uh, university libraries. And uh, as I mentioned, a very, very exciting time. And we really cannot do this work on our own. Uh, and we need to work like Kathy's been talking about, a more sustainable national approach. Uh, and the future is opened and other uh, work that is going on will help steer us in the right direction. Um, Namihi Nui, apologies for the uh, technology. There always has to be one person that uh, forgets to turn their microphone and video on, and it happened to be me. Uh, and uh, ka kiti anō, I'll see you again. Thank you, Kim. No apologies needed. Our next speaker is Keith Russell, who joins us from the Australian Research Data Commons. Thank you, Keith. Thank you, Claire. And I'm hoping my microphone is working correctly. There we are. Okay. Um, thank you all. Thank you for this invitation. It's lovely, uh, lovely to be here virtually and to present about uh, work that the uh, Australian Research Data Commons is doing. Um, so I'll take a slightly broader perspective in that um, the Australian Research Data Commons is very much about data and enabling Australian researchers to do their research around data. So our perspective is maybe slightly less directly on research publications, but on a broader, a broader array of research outputs. And for that, we usually use, we, we love the, the term that uh, UNESCO has been currently adopting a lot around uh, open science and the uh, uh, in promoting open science. And when we say science, we mean science in the context that UNESCO uses, which is all research, including humanities, arts, social sciences, and indigenous research. So um, there we are. Uh, first of all, I would like to acknowledge and celebrate the first Australians uh, on the traditional la lands on which we meet. Uh, for me, that's the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation here in Melbourne. 
So just for those people that don't know uh, the Australian Research Data Commons, we are funded under the National Collaborative Research Infrastructure Strategy. So we're a national organisation providing research infrastructure at a national scale. And our focus is not on one discipline or one area in particular, but very much around data and the breadth of data. And to give you a bit of a perspective why we care about open science and that breadth of open science is so our purpose is for to get Australian re provide Australian researchers with a competitive advantage through data. So that means on the one hand, they will need access to high quality data assets and software and tools to conduct that data intensive research that is necessary in the current times. But also there are increasing expectations from funders and from publishers uh, and from research organizations all around uh, all around the globe to ensure that research is conducted in such a way that it is actually um, transparent. It shows the research, that, uh, shows the, um, uh, the thinking behind the research and uh, under, underpinning the findings and enables the research outputs to be reusable and to provide benefits both to uh, society and also to a, a, a broader group. So from that perspective, we care a lot about open science and we care a lot about findable uh, accessible, interoperable, and reusable, fair, uh, fair data and software and tools. So we've done quite a bit around open science uh, in the last year. Um, so on the one hand, in the space of research data, uh, doing a lot of work with the institutions, 25, brought, brought together 25 universities to uh, see what an underpinning institutional framework would look like uh, to ensure that their researchers at the university can actually make properly manage their data and make their data fair. Uh, provide a lot of guidance around sensitive data. It can't be made openly available, but it can be made fair. It can be made accessible through appropriate routes. Um, to ensure that that foundational layer is there to share data and make it accessible, um, we've established a national uh, data repository community of practice and are getting the discussions going there. And in our co-investment partnerships, we've been really uh, investing in FAIR and trying to make sure that the data assets that are being produced are actually going to be FAIR. So more about that in a bit. Um, in the software space, there were the FAIR principles for research data but there were no fair principles for research software and software is a little different to data. So we worked internationally on a translation of those principles and they have been published in this year. So it's been a very exciting year from that perspective. And that's enabled us to get more clarity on and to be able to provide more guidance on what does it mean to make research software fair. So there we've been working on the visibility and increasing best practice and the sustainability of software outputs. And for both data and software, licensing is extremely important, so providing guidance and support around that. So these foundations were great, and we're going to build on these in the coming year. So uh, these fair national data assets that are being created as we speak will be released uh, as the projects uh, wind up around probably June next year. So that will be a very exciting time, and we'll be uh, we'll be spruiking these uh, these national data assets as these are becoming available for your researchers to use. Um, also, we'll be extending that institutional underpinnings network, so they'll be open to more universities to join. So if your institution is interested in joining, please join. Um, the data repository community practice is going to be start to pulling together shared requirements for what is necessary and what is needed. In the space of research software, we're going to be setting up a co-investment program, uh, inviting institutions, um, if they're interested in joining up, uh, for uh, to set up open source program offices. And in January, we hope to deliver a fair badging tool for software that we've jointly developed with the Netherlands eScience Centre, so that researchers can put a badge on their software and say, look, mine's actually fair. So there's data and there's software, but there's actually a number of activities that relate to both of these and tie these all together. So one of the things we will be doing and we will continue to do is advocate alignment and coherence in policies, both nationally and internationally, to ensure that it's tied together when we talk about, um, talk about publications and data and software and algorithms and tools. All of this is, requires uh, researchers to have the appropriate skills to create fair 
data and fair software. So we'll be continuing to work with the sector to develop those skills and to develop training materials uh, um, so that uh, research can be trained in this. One of the pieces of work to tie this all together is a network of persistent identifiers so that you can identify that a research project has resulted in um, uh, a publication with a DOI, a data set with a DOI, maybe software with a DOI, um, uh, and the author is identified with an ORCID and the organization is identified with a RAW. By having this network of uh, persistent identifiers, you can actually collect a lot more information about the outputs and how they relate to each other and enable that transparent uh, research with the right links between the different outputs. And finally, last but not least, uh, we will be really, uh, we'll be um, progressing our work around developing some thematic research data commonses, plural. And in those commonses, uh, the FAIR principles and also the CARE principles will be very important and will be a, a one of the key defining factors in how we set these up and how we design the uh, the outputs. So I think that hopefully gives you a bit of an idea where we're at and activities that are happening in the coming year. So uh, thank you all very much. And if you want to learn more, please subscribe to our newsletter. Thank you. Thank you, Keith. We are more than halfway. We're, we're going very well for time. So thank you to all our speakers for keeping to the lightning talk format. I'd like to now invite Ginny Barber from Open Access Australasia to the screen. Thank you very much, Claire. And um, I apologize if there have been tech issues. I think it may be my computer, but hopefully we're all okay. So um, I'm just gonna do a really lightning tour of um, Open Access Australasia. Um, I'm taking the, um, if, if the indulgence, if you don't mind, of looking very quickly back at 10 years because we are 10 years old this year. We were announced in Open Access Week um, 2012 and I thought it was good to just provide some perspective of what we've been doing over the past 10 years and how that ties into work um, going forward. So um, actually, so as I said, Open Access Australasia uh, started in 2012. Um, we've grown very substantially from that time. There were six universities, um, all Australian. And now um, we've moved in that time. We now have 30 universities across um, Australia and Aotearoa, New Zealand. Uh, but we all, importantly, we also include a diverse group of organisations uh, from Creative Commons Australia, uh, Toa Toa in New Zealand. Um, and this year, one of our newest members was the Australian Citizen Science Association. So we have a real interest in a diversity of not just open access approaches, but also open science approaches. Um, as I said, open access, uh, a AOSG as it was then with the almost unpronounceable acronym, uh, was announced in OA week 2012, um, with the work actually starting in January 2013. Uh, Danny Kingsley, who's now on our executive committee, was appointed as the executive officer. And this is a sort of snapshot of some of the work that happened at that time. It was around communication of promoting promotion of open access, which was by no means as big a deal as it was as it is now. Um, and the case for advocacy was was really quite critical at that time. Um, one of the things that you, you may well have seen is this fantastic diagram here that Danny Kingsley and Sarah Brown together developed, um, which um, is because of its incredible simplicity and, uh, you know, really important illustration of the benefits of open access has actually become, um, is, is you, you may see it all over the place, it's been, it's been adapted and it's one of the um, ways that people often talk, use things that they often use when they're talking about open access to people who are not familiar with the topic. So that was a really important piece of work uh, from, from early on. Um, over the next 10 years, the organisation changed and um, the, why this is, is, I guess, is important is it because it shows some direction about the way that we wanted to go. It, it started as an Australian open access support group. We kept the acronym, changed the name, um, included um, New Zealand universities in it, um, included um, different members. Um, and we move from a focus from just on open access to a more wider um, a reach. Um, in 2021, we did a large piece of work where we uh, changed our name. Um, we became Open Access Australasia. We did a look, we looked at our branding to see what whether that reflected what we wanted to be known for, and most importantly, we put a large piece of work into developing the resources and other initiatives that are on our website. And so, um, in the course of 10 years, we've, we've changed quite dramatically, but uh, we've tried to reflect the needs of the um, the open uh, access and open science community during that time. 
Um, so this is the organisation in 2022. Um, we have an executive committee which um, uh, spans the diversity of our members. Um, we also, uh, it's chaired by Kim Terry from, uh, from Auckland University of Technology and uh, Tom Cochran, who uh, was uh, from QUT, was one, who was one of the founding uh, members and drivers of Open AOSG at the time, uh, is our patron. Uh, we're a pretty small staff, so my, I'm the director, and then we, over the years we've had three uh, project officers um, who do a variety of work to support the work of the organisation. So what have we done in the last uh, 10 years? I have focused really just uh, mainly on the, on the most recent time, but it, it, it all feeds into um, a sort of arc of work that we've been involved in. Um, I would say that we've provide, been able to provide leadership on open access advocacy in Australia um, and in and support for work in outer in New Zealand. Um, we've done that, I think, by being quite successful in um, responding to consultations as they arise um, and also just trying to make the case for open access um, as appropriate when initiatives are discussed. We've been uh, delighted to work with CALL, um, uh, including on work on fair access, and I'll come on to that in, in a little bit. Um, and we've also spent a lot of time doing commentary across diverse venues. It's been, uh, as we know, a lot of the conversations that are happening in this space are in uh, social media in particular, um, and we've uh, focused on having an active um, campaign there. Uh, most recently, our website has um, now developed a comprehensive directory of open initiatives um, in the region, and we will be um, doing more work on that in the next uh, year or so. We support open access communities of practice. Um, we've had fun developing some um, innovative resources. One of the ones that we developed for last year was the open access escape room. Um, and if you haven't had a chance to have a go at that, we may well run it again. Um, and we've also done work on coordinating open access week in this region. One of the advantages, of course, we know of, um, of uh, going online is that you can reach a much bigger audience. And um, over the, since the COVID pandemic, we have managed to focus on having a really um, kind of uh, innovative and uh, kind of large outreach um, around Open Access Week, of which this is obviously part. Um, these next two slides are just quickly developed to the first of which it was in association with Call is just to show uh, the, the illustration of how open access has developed over the past 20 years in Australia and um, in, in New Zealand as well. What, what they do really show, I think, and I don't want to obviously dwell on parts of it now, all of it now, is just to show the importance of multiple actors within the system as we move to a more open ecosystem. So this is Australia and this is our in New Zealand. Um, so what's next? Um, we are we have a, a six principles that guide the work that we do, and I would just say that as we move to a more open even ecosystem, the ones that we are particularly concerned about are around equity and scholarly communications, both to access and publish research, and also diverse ecosystem of open access approaches. Um, all of these principles are important, but those ones are ones that we hear very often in discussions that are happening on open open access. Um, we are supporting uh, open science initiatives. We've been active in the UNESCO Open Science recommendation uh, when the language of that was finalised. Um, and with CALL and, open, and ARDC, we are, are co-leading a very new initiative called the Australian Open Science Network. And importantly, we've also worked with uh, regional and international initiatives. We know that all the work that is happening here is reflected in work that's happening elsewhere. And we spend a great deal of our time trying to make sure that we are in alignment with what's, with what's happening elsewhere. Um, so I would just like to say personally just to thank you to all of our member institutions who supported our work and to a really engaged group of um, uh, members, particularly of our executive committee over the years who've supported the work that we do. Um, and that's our website and our Twitter account there if you'd like to follow us further. Thanks very much. Thank you, Jenny, and happy anniversary. Happy 10th anniversary to Open Access Australasia. Our next speaker is uh, Elliot Bledsoe from Creative Commons. So Elliot, I'll invite you to take the screen. Hi, thank you, Claire. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Elliot, the co-lead of the Creative Commons Australia chapter. Uh, before I get started, I'd like to acknowledge the Turrbal and Yagara people as traditional custodians of the land on which I'm uh, presenting today. And I think particularly uh, as copyright practitioners and as advocates of open access, it's important that we recognise and respect that First Nations communities the world round have been sharing knowledge through networks for hundreds of thousands of years. So similar to Ginny, if you'll indulge me, I want to look a little bit at the history of Creative Commons and particularly its uh, 
its presence here in Australia uh, as a way of thinking about future directions and how uh, the CC licensing system uh, can support open initiatives here in Australia. So, of course, as many of you will be aware, it is the 20th anniversary of Creative Commons, uh, which was launched in the United States in 2001. And, of course, CC is an important standard for open sharing of content. Uh, providing an easy-to-use system that's back-ended with a legally certain uh, set of licences and a technical infrastructure that supports discoverability. In many ways, CC is really an integral part of the shift to open practices, uh, both within the open access community and other open movements. Um, of course, as many of you will know, CC has had a presence here in Australia since 2004. Uh, when QUT was named the affiliate uh, of Creative Commons International for Australia uh, and hosted the Creative Commons Australia project uh, for quite an extensive period of time. Now, of course, QUT worked in collaboration with a number of other partners, such as the Australian Government's Open Access and Licensing Program, or OSGOL, uh, and the National Copyright Unit. Uh, and these organisations worked together to support the use of CC in Australia. Uh, up until 2018, when Australia became the first country to create its own chapter under the new Creative Commons Global Network System, uh, which really saw uh, an opening up of the way that the kind of uh, country-based organisations or, or uh, initiatives worked uh, to really allow more players to uh, participate in that process. Um, CC Australia, as it currently stands, is an informal community of practice made up of interested individuals and organisations working collaboratively to realise the potential of CC in Australia uh, and to participate in similar activities around uh, the region. So we coordinate chapter meetings and we have a number of working groups. We organise engagement events and we share global news with, the, uh, with our chapter and with similar and related communities. And of course, membership is open to anyone uh, who wants to participate. So we do encourage all of you uh, to become a member if you share our enthusiasm for CC and its potential. Now, as this audience is undoubtedly aware, CC currently endorses a single set of licenses for use worldwide uh, with the current international version of the licenses, version 4.0, uh, being launched in November of 2013. Uh, of course, prior to the 4.0 licences, there were uh, a number of jurisdiction-specific licences that applied. Here in Australia, we've had four versions of the Australian CC licences, uh, 2.0, 2.1, 2.5 and 3.0. Uh, but of course, the 4.0 is the preferred licence at the moment. Uh, you'll all be aware, of course, that CC has been recommended through a whole range of different uh, government reports, inquiries, uh, activities, etc., particularly things like the uh, 2009 Government 2.0 Task Force report uh, and more recently the Productivity Commission's report on intellectual property arrangements, uh, which have both recommended uh, open access policies for publicly funded research with CC licences being uh, an integral part of that process. Um, in the OA space, of course, there's been lots of momentum, uh, much of which has been already discussed, so I won't dwell on it, but, you know, in particular, things like the ARC and uh, NHMRC open access policies and iterations of those, the call statement on open scholarship, uh, the FAIR statement, uh, open access and research conferences, uh, of course, Dr Cathy Foley's commitment to OA, uh, which, which is a, a really important piece of work, and so much more. Uh, I guess really a, a linchpin to that is the work of Open Access Australasia uh, in its tireless advocacy of open access. Um, I won't say too much more, but of course, there are a number of recent new initiatives that CC is looking at in its 20th year, uh, including things such as its open culture, its open climate and its open journalism initiatives, uh, which sit alongside longer running initiatives focused on copyright law reform globally, open education and open glam. I think the important thing is that, um, you know, CC plays a role in the open community uh, and is an active participant and player in that space. It, it has a set of uh, licences that create interoperability across licensed material, 
it increases user confidence in the use of licensed material, and it facilitates productive and innovative reuse of content, particularly of taxpayer-funded materials in the uh, OA and open government contexts. Um, I don't need to tell this group, of course, that opening up of knowledge is a key to solving the world's most pressing challenges. Um, and so I want to finish by talking a little bit about where to from here in relation to CC uh, in Australia. So there's always going to be a stewardship role for Creative Commons in relation to the licences internationally. But as we settle into the use of an international licence and scheme, uh, that applies worldwide, it leaves questions around what is the role of uh, localised or, or country-based groups that are interested in CC. And I think that the chapters and their connected communities are always going to have a role in educating and informing the transition to open access across a wide range of sectors. Um, and it will uh, play an important advocacy role in how to promote that transition. Uh, I also think that it's important to recognise that uh, the CC chapter here in Australia has resolved to adopt the international 4.0 licence and as a result we do encourage that Australian CC licence users transition to releasing their material under that licence and certainly encourage any new licence users to adopt it in the first instance. Um, we also encourage the adoption of the most permissive licence, the attribution licence, uh, but of course being alive to the fact that there are many legitimate circumstances that arise where it's desirable or necessary to apply a more restrictive CC licence. Um, CC is also increasingly involved in copyright reform processes in a number of countries. Uh, certainly the Australian chapter uh, continues to play a role in copyright law reform. Uh, as we noted in a recent submission, uh, in response to the exposure draft of the Copyright Amendment Access Reform Bill. Voluntary licensing schemes like CC are an important part of the copyright ecosystem, but they should not be thought of as a comprehensive solution for access to and reuse of knowledge and creativity. We all need to be working towards uh, a copyright system that places the need for the public interest at its heart, uh, that copyright law and policy reform worldwide and here in Australia needs to accommodate contemporary uses of copyright material that are in the public interest, of course, without undermining the incentives for copyright owners. So in closing, I'll say as a, a, a an informal group of people who are interested in Creative Commons and its use in Australia, the CC Australia chapter remains committed to the wide breadth of open movements, open activities, uh, and in particular has a strong commitment to supporting uh, and extending the work of uh, open access practitioners. So it's great to, to be here and to be able to participate. Thank you. Thank you, Elliot, and happy 20th anniversary to Creative Commons. Our final speaker for this lightning round is Kate Davis from the Council of Australian University Librarians. Thank you, Kate. Thanks, Claire. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands that I'm working on today, uh, the Yugambeh people here in South East Queensland. So when I put together this presentation, I realised that uh, open access at call uh, or open at call has done a lot in the last uh, 12 months. So I'm going to give you a whirlwind tour of some of the achievements that um, have been made collabor collaboratively and collectively with our member institutions over the last 12 months. I'll focus on three areas. First of all, the work that we've been doing around open educational resources, uh, the work that we've done in our advancing open scholarship program, and then finish off by talking about uh, read and publish agreements. Uh, one of my colleagues is going to drop some links in the chat as we go to all of the resources that I'm going to talk about. So the first space I'll focus on is championing open educational resources. Most of the work that we've done in this space this year has come out of our um, Enabling a Modern Curriculum Strategic Program uh, led by Fiona Salisbury from the University of Western Sydney. Uh, Fiona is a member of the call board. And I guess the headline act uh, in this space is the Open Educational Resources Collective, which we launched in uh, the beginning of 2022. The OER Collective um, provides a platform plus capacity building and community for uh, Australian and New Zealand university libraries to uh, get their toes into the open textbook space. It also provides a grant scheme to support authors in writing grants. Um, so some of the key highlights for the OER Collective 
Um, we have 32 participating institutions who've opted in to participate in the collective. Uh, the collective was conceptualized and put together by a team of uh, 12 project team members from core member institutions led by Tani Pierce from the University of Southern Queensland. And they have put literally hundreds of hours into uh, developing the model for the collective uh, and developing all the resources and community of practice events that we've held across the year. Um, I think where we can see the real benefits of the collective are around the grant program. We ran our first grant program this year and had 32 EOYs for uh, grant uh, funded uh, open textbooks. We awarded 15 grants, which was more than we were expecting to award. Um, we found some extra funding and were able to award $34.5 thousand dollars worth of grants. So come February next year, we should be seeing 15 new open textbooks uh, published as a result of the grants program. There's currently 37 open textbooks in progress across the network of participating institutions on our platform, plus all of the books that these institutions are working on on their own platforms as well. We've held uh, nine community of practice meetings um, featuring training and discussion, a couple of training sessions on how to use press talks um, and a community, community day event. Um, this is one of those really bold kind of audacious projects that has the potential to really push forward the open educational resources agenda in Australia and it's been a delight to work with Tani and the team uh, on pushing this forward this year. Alongside the collective we've had a couple of other projects both focusing on open educational resources. Uh, the first is the Open Educational Resources Professional Development Program. A foundations course is in its first offering at the moment with about 50 participants working their way through the course uh, and we've probably got three or four times that many on a wait list for the next offering of the course as well. This project's been led by Marion Slauson from Federation University and the team have done an amazing job of putting together um, not just uh, a set of content but a great educational experience, a uh, cohort-based experience where the class are moving through the course together over a 13 week period. The next project in the OER um, space is the Open Educational Resources Advocacy Project and the OER advocacy team have just published a toolkit that is designed to support uh, advocacy work across Australian and New Zealand universities um, to help them in advocating for open, open educational resources of all kinds, including open textbooks. This project was led by uh, Adrian Stagg from the University of Southern Queensland um, and that toolkit uh, is a great resource for those of you who want to advocate for OER in your institutions. While I'm talking about guides, I just thought I'd also mention the collective publishing guide. Um, now, the publishing workflow guide was developed specifically for the OER collective, but it is a great resource for um, anyone who's looking at uh, producing an open textbook. It's openly accessible, uh, so whether you're in the collective or not, you can access the guide and use it as a way to scaffold uh, your publishing activities. And like all of the materials that we produced this year um, on our uh, on our LibGuides platform. Uh, this is CC BY license. And you're welcome to pick it up and reuse it however you would like. So that's the work we've been doing around open educational resources. Uh, we also have an advancing open scholarship program. Uh, and in that space, I'm very pleased to announce that today we have launched the Libraries and Open Publishing Case Studies Guide. This was a project led by Tracy Cree from QUT, who's the uh, journals manager at QUT. And Tracy and the team have developed a set of case studies uh, designed to be used for advocacy, focused on how university libraries support and enable different types of open access publishing. So there's five case studies there about different types of open access publishing um, and there's PDF versions so you can print and reuse and uh, however you would like. Um, but the really exciting thing about this is it's a very simple case study format that I think um, lends itself to being extended in the future. So we look forward to seeing um, how this progresses and thanks very much to Tracy and the team for all their work on getting this live today. The final project in the uh, Advancing Open Scholarship Program is one that's still ongoing, um, but coming to its conclusion now, and that's the Fair and Open Non-Traditional Research Outputs Project. This project's being led by Dr. Gary Pierce at RMIT University, and they are currently working on a practice framework uh, to help libraries uh, in their support of researchers making their research outputs fair and open access, but uh, those non-traditional research outputs.
Uh, finally, in the advancing open scholarship space, I just wanted to highlight, and Ginny's mentioned this as well, um, that uh, this year, the fair steering group transitioned or reconstituted itself rather into the Australian Open Science Network uh, with a broader remit focused on um, open science and advancing the UNESCO Open Science Recommendation in Australia. Um, as well as some other activities. Um, we're now chairing that group with Open Access Australasia and the ARDC, uh, and it uh, has an expanded membership, which also includes um, uh, the Office of the Chief Scientist, as well as Australian Citizen Science Association um, and many others. Finally, before I finish up, I can't uh, not mention the work that has been done in the Read and Publish Agreement space at CALL over the last 12 months. Um, in the next couple of days, we'll be publishing an updated version of this poster, The Road to Open Through Strategic Procurement. Um, this outlines our pathway to um, progressing open access through strategic procurement activities, alongside all of the other work that we do in strategy to advance open access in other ways. Uh, so uh, many of you will be aware that at the beginning of this year, we launched four new agreements with Wiley, Springer Nature, Oxford University Press and Cambridge. Throughout this year, we've done um, a couple of things to support institutions in implementing these agreements, including um, publishing, uh, read and publish publishing dashboards on calls Tableau online instance. We've just uh, engaged a consultant to rapidly scale up our reporting, um, and we've been working with them throughout this, uh, this month as well. And we also implemented a transformative agreements implementation community of practice, which is a forum for discussion of issues and practice around implementation of all kinds of transformative and read and publish agreements. At the moment, we're anticipating there'll be five new uh, read and publish agreements for 2023, uh, two with major publishers and three with mid-sized publishers. Um, so that's a really exciting development. And that's exciting because of numbers like this. So as at the 31st of October, which is the most recent comprehensive data we've got across all the agreements, um, Australian and New Zealand researchers have published approximately 8,000 open access articles year to date under the call negotiated read and publish agreements. Um, so that's a significant boost to the number of uh, research outputs that are freely um, and openly accessible um, to all Australians and uh, New Zealanders and indeed everyone around the world as a result of these agreements. In closing, I just wanted to highlight that really the achievements that we've been able to make in open access uh, and open in general over the last 12 months are down to um, collaboration, contribution of our members and member institution staffs, um, collective action and scale. I think we've been able to push forward and produce resources and materials and initiatives like the OER Collective to support practice in this space. Um, because we collaborate, uh, because people are willing to contribute, um, and because of the collective action that we can take at scale. Um, and so I just wanted to highlight the contributions that many, many people have made um, in many, many hours to, to bring together this program of work over the last 12 months. That's it from me. Thanks very much, Kate. Uh, we do have some questions for our speakers and uh, while they turn their cameras back on, I think Kate's um, final slide there captured some of the work that I've been writing down through this session. And while there are differences between the experiences in Australia and New Zealand, what came through really strongly for me from all speakers really are our strengths and our commitment to advocacy, to collaboration, to unity, to leveraging shared partnerships and shared relationships and from learning from each other. So we do have some questions in the chat and our first question is for Cathy Foley. Is Cathy still with us? Yes, I'm here. Lovely, thank you, Cathy. So Cathy, the question that was, um, and I'll just read part of this, is I'm worried that a central Australian government agreement on open access just provides more income to the publishers who charge us many dollars. So we do have um, diamond open access journals in Australia that do not charge article processing charges and we need modest funding for them. Um, do you have any comment on how um, your approach or additional government funding might be available to strengthen those publications rather than just the multinational profit-making publishers? 
So uh, first of all, we should point out that Australian researchers publish with about 1,100 publishers. So we have about four, 50% in the top four. Next 25% is in the next 13. And then there's 1,060 something in the, next, in the last 25%. So this is really important because that last 25% with that bibliodiversity is really critical. We've done a report on that we call the long tail because we think that's very a, a critical part of um, the landscape for, uh, for making sure that our research is published in the most appropriate places and that um, authors get to choose where they need to publish. And so, um, and so what we've, when we've talked to small publishers, including those that are diamond open access, they see this as a way of actually supporting them to be more sustainable and be able to be, uh, uh, be able to reach further, or, uh, further readership. So this is actually a win-win. Uh, I think it shouldn't be seen as something which is just giving a support for the big publishers. What it's doing is creating a way of having collective bargaining, which allows you to have a single organisation, which is much larger than a whole range of smaller organisations engaging with, whether it's big publishers or small publishers. And we know, for example, um, how successful that has been in Australia for uh, when we went um, from every pharmacy and doctor negotiating with, with um, pharmaceutical companies to having the PBS, which has meant that we've been able to give keep a lid on the cost of pharmaceuticals in Australia. And we're um, uh, expecting that that same ability of uh, having a collective approach will also allow us to keep a lid on the costs as well. So this isn't, I think the thing we have to remember is uh, we need to make sure we have pro robust pro processes that um, we're trying to look at things that are sustainable for and um, and making sure that we manage costs and that we also have access to back catalogues because you've got to remember that research is not just in the future but it's also what's been in the past and that's is critical to access and so uh, setting up things in the future which don't allow open access for the past is not necessarily going to serve as well. And can I have one other thing, and that is we need to also, Australia really wants to be seen internationally as following the rule of law and, uh, and having a management of I, the law, IP laws that go around that is a very important um, thing for Australia because uh, some countries don't follow that and, and there's quite a lot of geopolitical anxious um, feelings between those countries, which is causing quite a lot of skirmish and upset. And so this is something where we need to be seen as squeaky clean on this. Thank you. George, do you have a, a similar um, response for Aotearoa New Zealand? Um, the person who asked this question also referred to the New Zealand Initiated Free Journal Network as, as something that's already happening in your country. Um, so unfortunately, I wasn't fully aware of the of the, of the the Free Journal Network. So, um, so I, I, I probably can't comment on that. Um, so we uh, certainly, my discussions have. Uh, there are concerns uh, around simply negotiating a, a, a change in the cost um, just from one side to the other. Uh, you know, one point in the publishing uh, uh, and you know access to to another point without uh, a more kind of a underlying change into the way that 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 academic research works. And so I think we have taken more the route of um, not so much mandating or encouraging diamond access, but diamond diamond open access, but but trying other routes. I'm we're a, a lot um, we're well behind where you are, so I think we're we're more watching watching what's going on with uh, with what. Uh, Kathy and and your community is doing and matching what we can and also you have to recognize that we are we are substantially smaller in terms of our, of, of the output um, and so I, I think in some ways we have less clout but obviously working together and joining with what is happening in Australia is 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 um, important to us so yeah I'm probably not in a position to comment much more than than that sorry. No, that's absolutely fine. You've mentioned there um, that you are, I guess, watching what's happening in Dr. Foley's office, and someone has asked, uh, are your offices working together, and how do you support each other in the open access space? 
So, so we've we actually been talking um, between George and myself and um, with Juliet and, um, and had several conversations and also with Kim as well. And, um, and our aim is to first of all, get the Austra Australian version across the line, but also uh, look at where Australia is you know, one of the bigger countries in the region and how we can also then use this in time to uh, partner with uh, countries like New Zealand and also Pacific nations um, uh, where we really need to make sure that we're able to support them to be, uh, we're, we're in a, a time in history where science, technology, information, uh, our social sciences and um, humanities, arts um, are really critical for you know, the future of humanity and being able to make sure that uh, we're supporting um, smaller countries to be able to participate in understanding what knowledge is available and uh, helping them to grow their research spaces too is absolutely critical. And as we move, have moved on to digital platforms, uh, we haven't really used that opportunity as well as we could for the soft, soft diplomacy. So this is something which is a long-term plan. This is just step one. And this isn't just uh, do this and, and move on. It's actually part of a longer term plan to move out and use this as, as something where we will hope that you know countries which are small, we can um, work together in, in having um, um, a, a, an approach which works for um, both New Zealand in this case and Australia, as well as um, more broadly. George, I don't know if you want to say anything more. Um, just very briefly, so yes, this is just the beginning for us in particular of a, of, a, of a long journey around open science, I think, and, and to see it in, in isolation from that would would be a mistake. And my, our office has very limited control over, over what the New Zealand science system does to that regard. And so I think one of the key things is, is to get the, the Ministry um, for, for Business and Innovation and Employment directly involved in these discussions. And so, as I said, they're doing a lot of work and they're talking to a lot of people, but I think um, getting representatives from that agency in conversations like this would be tremendously valuable, and we're, we're going to give that a go. Thank you. Pru, I'm going to throw to you now. Um, I've had a couple of questions about the reaction to the policy and the response. Um, and re firstly, you know, what has been the response from research to the policy? And then perhaps has there been a response or a reaction from the publishers who um, might be impacted by the policy? Yeah, thank you. So reaction from researchers. Um, so we have strong support from the health and medical research community for the objectives of our policy, for making um, our publications um, open access, um, for the greater use and sharing of research outputs and research outcomes. But of course, it doesn't come without concerns. And the greatest concern from researchers is, is pragmatic, um, getting your publications published is stressful enough you could say and it is a major part of the academic enterprise and an important activity for researchers and we do recognize that we've added additional things for them to think about in terms of compliance with the policy um, and so that might include um, them having to think about how do they find open access journals that are compliant um, up front or how they might understand um, how to use the repository-based open access. So what we've tried to do, obviously, with our policy is make all of those resources upfront and available and point people towards them. But I think it is really where we will also be relying on a range of other players in the system, many of whom have spoken today and are otherwise on, uh, on this um, call today, um, who will also be providing those so that sort of support and information. Um, and of course, depending on which route a researcher picks to go towards to, to comply with the policy, they could also be looking at upfront costs. Um, and so some of the concern is, well, well, how do we manage that when that's not something we've had to manage before? That, that, that side of it has been dealt with somewhere else in the system before. So really all of those resources and support from, from institutions, from organisations like Call and others are going to be important to help kind of support the system adapt to um, an open access future but that's what we've heard they support what we aim to do but are worried about what it means individually for them and how they're going to navigate through it yeah, the what's in it for me is always the clinch isn't it yeah um, um, sorry Prue. yes would you like to respond to the response from the publishers 
Yeah, sure. And I think the specific question was around whether or not publishers will change their, their behaviour around the 12-month embargo and, and use of repositories, which is uh, um, an interesting question. I think the important thing is to remember is that there are different publishers and so they'll respond differently. And it's always important to remember that there are open first journals where this won't be an issue because you know, all of the mentioning of the diamond type journals earlier for example where it is it's open first it's compliant it's not there's no need to consider change um, for those publishers that have been reliant historically on subscription models they have to think about how their business might adapt and I know there's lots of innovative things they're thinking about in the background but you will see that there is um, a kind of preference or focus on on the article processing charge model or on the read and publish agreements from those sorts of publishers. Um, and of course, we've heard concerns um, that publishers or journals might refuse to accept a manuscript submitted for publication with the kind of open licensing um, statement up front. And that concern's been heard for a while because we're not the first funder to do this. There's European funders in particular under Plan S that have gone ahead and, and that concern has been expressed. But we're actually yet to see any evidence of publishers or journals rejecting a manuscript um, from an author that has, uh, has sought to comply with their funders' open access policy. Um, and so it's just really important to remember that that's the purpose of the rights retention strategy is to um, encourage authors to get out front and say up front, I retain the rights to this publication. Um, and that includes being able to then to submit it to a repository irrespective of where it's published. And there are resources and guides to help researchers kind of understand that um, and, and react to those things. So yeah, I, we don't know exactly how publishers respond because there's a time frame for all that to happen and anything can happen, but we have seen movements in the right direction um, across a range of players in the system. For our last question, I might throw to Ginny and Elliot first and then allow others to, to jump in if we have time. But we have reflected uh, particularly around Open Access Australasia and Creative Commons around the momentum that we've achieved so far. How do we keep that momentum going? And is it dependent on the passion of the various practitioners that we engage with? So Ginny, perhaps I might throw to you first. Yeah, I, I don't, I'm delighted to say I don't think it is just reliant on the passion of advocates now. I think that this has now moved into the mainstream. I think that we're hearing very, you know, clearly articulated arguments for the importance of open access and open science more generally. I, I didn't really talk about it, but the UNESCO Open Science Recommendation has absolutely put open science, which includes open access, right at the front of, uh, at, you know, the global um, sort of imperative. And I think that one of the first things that we can just do is to continue to have these arguments to un you know, unpack what we mean about open access, open science, and just make sure that it's also built into the, um, not just the, the funding and the kind of the um, the day-to-day -day of universe, but also, for example, think about the incentives that researchers are given. So I think there's a whole, I think there's, it, you can come across it from a lot of different approaches, but I think it is now sort of woven into the mainstream of, of how we do research really. Elia, did you want to comment on that one as well? Look, I'll, I'll echo Ginny's comments. I do think that a lot of these uh, ideas have gone from what might have been perceived as fairly fringe concepts, uh, say 10, 15, 20 years ago, uh, and they've very much become uh, rooted in the core of future thinking towards uh, open methodologies in a wide range of areas, open access being one of those. Um, that said, I also think it is important to recognise that um, passion is a key part of how this space works and that we all advocate for these things because we do see uh, a brighter, better, more equitable, more inclusive future that we can all take part in together. Um, I think it's also important to recognise that these ecosystems are made up of a combination of players, some of which are paid, some of which are volunteers, some of which are paid some of the time, some of which are volunteers some of the time. And so uh, I, I do reckon, recognise that it's important that we uh, find ways of sustaining these kinds of activities and movements, um, but also that that isn't done in a way that downplays uh, the valuable contributions of a wide range of advocates uh, operating in both uh, kind of paid and unpaid roles. Um, I would also say that uh, one of the things that we're very conscious of in terms of Creative Commons Australia is that uh, as a licensing system that is widely used by a range of different uh, 
disciplines that there is lots of passion in lots of directions. And so as the kind of the infrastructure layer, I guess, um, we are uh, very supportive of a range of open movements uh, and we recognise that sometimes, uh, sorry, that's my cat there in the corner. Um, we, we're very conscious that, uh, you know, lots of people are pushing lots of different ideas and so we are keen to be a, a way, a conduit of talking about how the licences can best support a really wide range of open activities, um, which doesn't mean that we don't have uh, a lot of love and affection for the open access community. We share that across a range of open movements. Thank you, Elliot. Well, we will leave it there. I would like to thank all of our speakers for being so generous with their time and their knowledge and their expertise today. Um, I've certainly taken extensive notes and have much to reflect on. And we did promise you a rapid overview of the key developments in open access, and I think we have met our um, promise. And I suspect that in years to come, we might look back on 2022 as a significant turning point for open access, both in Australia and Aotearoa, New Zealand. So thank you very much for joining us today. Please check out the range of events happening across uh, Australia and New Zealand for Open Access Week, and we will make the recording of this session available in the not-too-distant future. Thank you very much.